This is a Reader's Digest version containing many of the interesting parts of the Flat Earth Theory. For those who have already started seeing things with new eyes, it will be mostly a recap, but there could be a few new angles you haven't looked at. For the rest of you who are new to this, the first question is invariably, is this a joke? Because it's a joke, right? And that's where we start, because it's one of our two basic childhood facts. 1 plus 1 equals 2, and the Earth is a globe. We're taught this before almost everything else, and that right there should give you a clue on how serious this secret is. But for those who have forgotten their history, here's the modified Men in Black version. For the first 4,000 years of our civilization, we believed that the Earth was a flattish disk surrounded by a solid dome barrier called the firmament. All of the five major religions had their own version of this, and the churches enforced the belief. Then, around 1514, a man named Copernicus created a new model of the world. He stated that if the Earth was spinning around 1,100 miles an hour and circling the sun at 60,000 miles an hour, the world was then round. And while the math more or less worked, there was a problem. It was 1,500, and the technology to prove such a theory wasn't there. The first balloon to carry people wasn't invented until 1760. Sailboats were the only travel over water, and the fastest thing on land was a horse. But the new worldview was promoted and took hold. The religions adapted to handle the new reality, and life moved on. More importantly, the globe model was quickly introduced into the education systems. Over the next 500 years, the challenges to this model faded, to the point where the globe was accepted as universally as physical laws such as gravity. Read that again if you didn't absorb it. For 20 generations, people believed that the Earth was round because there was a globe in every classroom they sat in. There was no proof. Hundreds of years went by, and still civilization had no way of proving the theory. Planes were invented around 1900, but until 1957, nothing could go high enough to give a true perspective of where we lived. And that's when everything got strange. The United States and Russia both sent up rockets high enough to take decent pictures, and what they saw scared them a great deal. How do we know they were extremely concerned about the sky? Because the U.S. and Russia immediately started firing nuclear weapons straight up, and they kept firing for the next four years. A few things to keep in mind here. First, this was now 1958. Nuclear weapons were very expensive and hard to come by. These also weren't those nominal yield 20 kiloton toys we used on Hiroshima. This was high kiloton to low megaton, and we couldn't get them up fast enough. And the strangeness continued in other places. In 1959, only a year into the atmosphere bombardment, Ten nations, including the United States, made Antarctica off-limits to any colonization. A treaty was put in place, and to this day remains intact. Over 50 nations now have signed off on this treaty. Do you know any treaty that has lasted that long between all industrialized nations? Moreover, do you know any piece of real estate in the world that is owned by no one? You would think, at the very least, one of the large oil companies would use their huge financial resources to explore this region, and yet they don't even petition the idea. The short version of the discovery is this. By 1958, the military had discovered the very solid upper and outer edges of our world, and had to create a way to put up Do Not Enter signs without looking obvious. It was tricky, but if there is one thing I have learned about the authority, it's that nothing is left to chance. Most of the work had already been done for them, so their job was primarily in the details. The sky part of the dome was much higher than commercial air traffic, so the only thing they had to worry about there was the space program, which is immediately militarized. The outer border had the natural benefit of not only an extensive ocean, but a scaling decrease in temperature and a steady increase in iceberg frequency to discourage ships, all leading to a permanently frozen landmass that could not be used for any form of agriculture. This ocean and ice layout had worked well for thousands of years because the technology of the current civilization didn't evolve quickly. 
sailors avoided cold weather seas whenever possible, and oxygen levels get low enough to harm people, even on high mountains. The brilliance of the design comes in the simple fact that human males are corrupted by power. Corruption so total, in fact, that they would rather hide the world itself rather than risk their power on it. You could theorize that kings and popes were told of the world a long time ago. Maybe an ancient scroll or book. Perhaps an interdimensional being told the tale of what the world looked like. But this was all but dismissed, because even the most powerful leaders of the day couldn't reach the borders. And if they couldn't, what chance did the general public have? It's one thing to be told of the giant impenetrable dome, but it's a whole different animal when you finally stand right next to it. Then the tough decisions have to be made. Do we keep the secret? And how far are we willing to go to keep the status quo? Once they decided to keep the secret, no expense was spared. The rapid progression of rocketry science had to be addressed quickly, and so the moon missions were created. Matt from the NASA channel was right in his thinking that you needed the moon mission event to stage a picture of the Earth from deep orbit, and that couldn't be more true. Establishing NASA as the frontrunner of space exploration also diverted people who would have otherwise created their own space companies for profit. The best engineers, technicians, and pilots were recruited to the NASA space program. Once there, they were compartmentalized on a need-to-know basis. The astronauts know of the deception and are sworn to secrecy under the penalty of whatever motivates them. Private space programs are discouraged, sabotaged, or absorbed into the NASA fold. Private sector spacecraft are just not going to be allowed for several reasons. The most obvious is the collision with the dome itself. The telemetry data from such a mission would show an impact failure at a certain altitude, and if repeated, would raise questions NASA just isn't prepared to answer. There are three perpetual questions about our world that can't be eliminated, but avoided at all costs. These are the questions you should ask yourself and others if this protective layer is going to be lifted. I'd like to preface this with a thank you to Max Malone, a conspiracy hardcore who has a knack for boiling down debates to a single paragraph whenever possible. It was he who said, after over 50 years and thousands of hours of space travel footage, both by NASA and other countries, there is no exterior shot where the astronaut completes the simple act of panning the camera 180 degrees, let alone a full 360 degree sweep. This has never happened on any moon mission, exterior space station, nothing, ever. Statistics will tell you that this would have already happened by accident years ago, but it hasn't, and it won't. This is because of the rule they cannot break, the same rule that applies to television set shows that never show the fourth wall. Why? Because there is no fourth wall. Number two. When you search online for pictures of the Earth from space, 95% of what you will see is a collection of artificial composite shots. In 2000, when I did this search, there was exactly one picture by NASA showing the bottom part of Africa and Antarctica. Now that picture is hidden within hundreds of simulated images. There are HD cameras everywhere and no one is taking a shot of the Earth because you can't get enough altitude to do it. Number three, the commercial air travel routes for the southern hemisphere are wrong. This is an easy thing you can check out in 60 seconds. Take a map reading of the distance between anywhere near Australia and anywhere in South America. It's a straight shot across the South Pacific. Now find your favorite travel site and try to get there non-stop. See what happens. The routes start turning ridiculous. I used to business travel for years and I've never seen anything like it. It's the one thing in the general public world they can't hide, the actual distance between these two places. On a round world, the flight is easy, just a straight shot across an ocean. But on a flat world, it becomes the greatest distance between two points. There are no shortcuts, so they distract you with multiple connections and layovers. 
It's only blind luck that the United States was in the Northern Hemisphere. Otherwise, the increased traffic would have raised eyebrows by now. I know. I know. It's madness. It's lunacy. There are people who will tell you straight to your face that all the leaders of the world are lizards, and yet these people laugh out loud when you say the words flat earth. I was, and still am, a huge conspiracy guy. I literally ran out of new tin hat topics to research, and I still wouldn't look at this one without embarrassment. But every time I glanced at it, there was something unresolved, and once I saw the near perfection of the whole plan, I was hooked. Do your own homework. Ask the questions. Get past the possibility and see if you can move into an even bigger picture, like who built the dome and why. That's where it starts to get really interesting and things start opening up. I know I said years ago that the greater good was something that should be preserved, that JFK, Pearl Harbor, and 9-11 were inevitable. I still believe it and I understand the decisions. The globe illusion, however, has run its course over the last 500 years. It's time to start again. If that means we end up getting the attention of who or what created this place and force the reset of the world, is that such a bad thing? I've put some links in the description that you might want to check out, like the current map projections used by the USGS, the United Nations logo, the Flat Earth Society, high-altitude nuclear tests, the Antarctica Treaty, among others. I'm not allowing ratings or comments on this video for several reasons. One, this topic seems to bring out the worst debates because of the initial denial. That, and I've seen dedicated trolls on the Flat Earth Society website who show up every day and say the same thing to new forum members. It's a joke. It's not serious. Nothing to see here. Kind of strange that there are full-time trolls on a site that has less than 500 members worldwide. That being said, please feel free to contact me at msergeant23 at comcast.net or heck, just call 303-494-6631. I know no one uses the actual phone anymore, but I'll answer what I can.